So welcome. Thank you for being here today. I will start with a very simple question to introduce yourself uh, briefly and also um, give us a little bit like your, your connection to the, to the topic of green coding. Should I start with you, Anita? Yeah. Okay, my mic is still turned off. Okay. Uh, my name is Anita Schüttler. I'm here from a company called Neuland in Bremen and we build software for large scale e commerce. And I'm originally a programmer and I have a second job, and that is um, I'm a sustainability professional for two years now, so I combine those two uh, topics. And in my current job as a head of sustainability in this IT company, I, um, I deal a lot with topics like circular economy, like um, reporting stuff, materiality assessments, and so on. And uh, green coding is one of my topics, just, yeah. A lot to do in the field of sustainability. What about you, Jana? What brings, us, uh, brings you here today? Uh, you invited me, so the, that is the easiest. It's easiest a very answer. Finnish answer right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. I, I could do full, full Kimi Raikkonen here, but yeah. Uh, so, my name is Janne Kalliola. I'm the founder of Exove, a 100-plus software company in Finland. Also the chairman of the board for software, oh, sorry, Code from Finland Association. That uh, actually is the, my route to the sustainable world, we launched a carbon neutral software company label, the world's first one, uh, and also very tight, tight one a couple of years ago. There are seven companies now in Finland that are carbon neutral uh, with, the, with our, our criteria, and that led me to wonder that the, why software is written so badly nowadays compared to the good old 80s when I started coding. Um, and then I first thought that, okay, I'll just make fuss about it, and then nobody actually, nothing changed, so I decided that I, I need to be a change agent. So I wrote a free book called Green Code, 130 pages, about how to, how to write green code and uh, how to take AI data and the IoT and the, all the other stuff into, into account. And then I've been speaking about the evangelizing this thing in, in Finland and abroad. Very nice. I think awareness is always a, a useful tool. What about you, Max? What brings you here? Uh, same reason, same reason, so you invited me. But beside that, um, on the one hand side, I always carry my hat of being a managing director and founder for a company called Liquid Reply, focusing on all these open source, cloud native infrastructure thingy. But this has a background of like six years of contributing to open source, contributing to open source infrastructure components, Kubernetes, and all those things. And um, yeah, we recently found within these open source uh, foundations, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, um, a technical advisory group for environmental sustainability. So the very simple idea is like, hey, there's a couple of hundreds, five, six hundred open source tools where we all want to give advice how to be more sustainable, to give them a tooling on the hand, to measure per release how good or bad they are currently are performing and how they can get better, because there's one simple scaling factor behind it. Most of these tools running a billion times on this planet. So just make it a little bit better, hopefully also will improve a little bit the software which we can see here. It's a great example of the scaling effects of software, right? Uh, Atanas, what brings you here? Uh, Atanas Atanas is my name. Uh, I'm working at Intel uh, in the networking and edge uh, group, business unit uh, in the software department there. Um, I'm responsible for the soft, uh, software which uh, deals with CPU management in Kubernetes um, and uh, also some power uh, optimizations, power management um, kind of uh, um, algorithms which we uh, try to integrate with Kubernetes. Um, from background, uh, I'm coming from HPC field, former researcher in the TU Munich. Um, so this little bit is connected with the topic here. So there are two ways how you can get um, to more green kind of software, write more efficient software. This is wh what HPC people do. Um, so try to tune the software to the real limit. Um, and yeah, if your software still has some limitations and cannot use all these uh, resources, uh, then you could think um, maybe to use some mechanics, how how uh, to turn off certain certain parts of the hardware, so that you don't use power. So we are looking into that. Yeah, that's interesting. I think like Intel plays a very important role in this whole game of uh, trying to be more transparent and also 
getting the data that we need. Um, nice. This panel today is really about figuring out and discussing what are some barriers to adoption. So I will ask them a few questions on how can we get green coding yeah, wide, widely adopted? How can we get people excited about it? Um, what are the barriers and what wishes do you guys have to take these barriers down, ideally? Um, I start with you, Anita. What do you think um, are the main barriers right now to the wider adoption of, of green coding? Um, I'll just go ahead and say no one's asking for it. Yeah, there is uh, interest within my company, for example, for the topic, but uh, then I always come to the point where um, people say, yeah, but our customers aren't asking for it. And I think that's all connected to uh, the awareness problem, yeah, nobody knows what's going on because there's, it's like with global supply chains, yeah, the, the real bad stuff is happening somewhere far away where no one can see it and it's basically the same uh, with the layers you have in software, where it's running, where the hardware is coming from. It's, um, it's seen as something clean because no one sees what's going on there. So. Um, and yeah, the topic's not in the education there, so uh, yet, so uh, uh, programmers don't know about it, and companies don't see it, and even if they go ahead and take a look at it, it's just this very small part compared to what they do. Other than that, like uh, shipping uh, products around the world and so on. So, yeah. That's that's a good, a good answer. So education and awareness is, is still missing. Max, you, you, you used a very big number, right? Like billions of calls. So, so you are aware, obviously. Uh, what do you think are the barriers in, in the work that you see? Um, so in companies where we work with, but also in the whole open source ecosystem, we see one, one large problem, which is a cognitive load for developers. It's like the amount of complexity which a regular software developer has to deal with that takes away all the headspace to focus on anything else. So even if someone wants to, that person really needs to find a way to get rid of tons of other things the person has to take care of. And that's something which we see, it doesn't matter how much optimized and automated um, processes are. If you look into the Kubernetes project, uh, we have thousands of contributors. The software is tested every day 7,000 times uh, per per commit and there's hundreds of clusters simultaneously running for this and everything is automated. Like no one touched this at all. But for every contributor who wants to start with it, it needs half a year to one year until that person can do one relevant pull request. And this is a very long track and that's what we also see in major enterprises and so on that you have too much complexities around it, even so we try to make it more better, right? We have DevOps practices and platform engineering and CICD and you name it, always a target to make actually things more simple, but at the same time, companies struggle with cloud migration, with containerization, uh, introducing new technologies, having trends coming up. I'm pretty sure most of the IT leaders nowadays don't think it's sustainability, sustainability at all because they're hanging up on OpenAI and just want to use ChatGPT and find out how they want to use uh, generative AI. So all these trends always like also give more, take, take away more headspace to really focus on it. So technology is a distraction then. Every new technology that comes along distracts us from making quality software again, essentially. Yep. Yep. Interesting. Um, what about you, Jana? You've been raising awareness for this topic for quite some time. Do you feel like people in Finland are maybe more aware or across Europe are getting more aware? And, and what do you see as the barriers? Yeah, I think that people are aware, but they still don't change their behavior. So there's, I think that the, um, all, all these, I agree with all these points. I, I would like to add that the, the electricity and hardware is too cheap. That is one thing. Um, I'm waiting that whether there, there's a first estimate that there would be a, a lack of silicon in a couple of years so that would be interesting that whether whether that actually changes dynamics uh, then the industry has spent the maybe the last 20 years or so focusing on the developer productivity and not the end system productivity that much so there's uh, 
certain aspect of laziness in the in the industry that the uh, it, it's it's also sort of the other flip side of the coin is the is the cognitive load that Max Max talked about. So the uh, it's 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 complex topic. But a lot of the stuff that happens there is just because then the developer can do it faster or with less thinking and so forth. And uh, then the the whole industry is always lusting for the next next new thing. And every single developer hates the sales guys that sell the next version of the product and not the current one. So when you are lusting new devices, you are part of the problem, not part of the solution. So if you would cope with the old devices, there was the, the obsolescence stuff and so forth, but if you would cope with old devices, you would not last for the new stuff, then I think that it would be a healthier industry, and a more sustainable industry. Which brings me to an interesting maybe follow-up question. What about, what about the legacy systems? Right? What about all this, these applications that are sitting around that maybe nobody's using anymore? What do we do about those? Of course, if nobody is using any those, they should be shut down. But you should embrace the legacy. You should. The, I'm waiting that moment that more of this software developers work go maintaining the old stuff than creating new stuff. That will come sooner or later. And uh, if you are not approaching pension age right now, then it might be that you end up there. So you should embrace right now that you work with somebody else's code because that is the future for most of us, I would say. I think that's quite a shift. Atanas, what about you? So we heard also that we're running out of silicon. First, you have to tell us if that's true. But then, of course, the same question goes to you. Um, what are the barriers that you see to the wider adoption of green coding outside of HPC? Yeah, I think the times are still far when, when, when we will get to that time when we run out of silicon. There's yeah, uh, we try to distribute currently um, the, the production of silicon uh, to have it locally in Europe, in US, in, in different parts of, uh, of the world. Um, and um, yeah, in terms of uh, um, what's, what's the, the blocking factor, I agree with the other speakers here that the awareness is one of the main issues. And I see a big disconnect between developers, companies, and governments. Um, some developers, what they want is basically uh, to run on, on the latest and greatest stuff, run the most modern algorithms available out there. And they just put it somewhere remotely, they don't care about it. Um, but yeah, actually, um, I had the opportunity in the past to work for, uh, do some public, procure public procurement projects. And if you see the bills in Europe, uh, actually, a lot of the bills for procuring a data center come from power. So they they basically are far greater than than actually acquiring the hardware over the time. If you basically calculate the costs for running that data center over five years, it's it's far more than uh, actually acquiring that data center. Um, so that developers don't know about it. I think uh, maybe making them aware would be good, <laughs> right? And um, yeah, uh, I think that that's, uh, it's one of the missing factors currently. Good. I'm tempted to do like an instant poll and there's also a question. Yeah. Jola, you want to come up here or Maria's gonna come to you? Maria's gonna come to you, very nice. Let's have the question first, then we'll do a poll. Um, I have just one question for Max. Uh, he spoke about complexity, and I was wondering, is there a problem of complexity or an issue where the current IT force has no clue regarding what green coding is? Because we've worked with a lot of practitioners, and the real thing we noticed is they have no clue. Yeah. <clears throat> so we talked about this also a little bit earlier uh, down by coffee. The thing is, if, you're, if I throw the word clean coding into the room, those who have a software background think about this very big book and like, okay, I have an instruction set. I have a very concrete guideline where I have to follow and know what to do. If I say green coding, people think about, okay, wait, I can adjust the system. I know how to optimize the system. I maybe know what is best practice to not use too much resources in this and that way. Um, you will come up with like, oh, 
you should think about the right way of doing search and sur uh, sort and whatsoever, but there's not yet the this full construction set on it, right? This is the, like people really do not know exactly where to start with. There's no 100% no good starting point for it. And yes, knowledge is always a problem. Um, you have a big knowledge gap in this regards anyhow, um, also because this field is currently pacing up with research and new tools and new products which are coming out to the market, helping to optimize maybe software, helping to optimize the infrastructure. Um, but this can also like overthrow people with too much information suddenly again. And again, they have already a difficult background because they need to get, uh, get around with cloud and different programming languages and microservices and whatsoever. I think I'll let Anita jump in first and then I get Janne. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, I agree. But I also think that um, a problem is who's responsible for this? Yeah, you have the programmer sitting there and uh, you can do a lot as a programmer via scaling effects. We talked about this. Um, but in the end, you have conflicts because there's someone else coming to you telling you uh, what to do what software to write. So in the end, you have, I'll, I'll zoom out a little now, yeah? You have um, software being built, and what we can do as programmers is make the software a little less bad, but it's still not good, because what what does this software do? Yeah, it's, um, in my case, it sells products. And in another case, it does other stuff. Yeah, you, as the problem is we're talking about efficiency here, and to become sustainable, you need three things. You need the green uh, green energy, yes, you need efficiency, but you also need sufficiency. And I think that part is what's still very much underrated. We have to do less. And we're living in a system that promotes generating money. And we're living in the universe, now I'm getting very much high up, yeah, that has laws of physics, like maybe a lot of you know this, the second law of therm thermodynamics that says any available energy gradient, yeah, difference in energy has to be leveled out. So any available energy has to be spent as fast as possible. So I'm actually quite pessimistic about this whole thing because in the end, as long as there's cheap energy, just what you said, Jana, it will get spent. And the only way to get out of this is having hard limits set by someone who's in power to set hard limits. Because um, as long as we don't have those hard limits, everyone's just going to spend a lot more and maybe lithium will be gone way too fast for us to survive. Yeah, there's other laws in, that in nature that say um, you can go up in spending your energy but only until the point where you're gonna die. So we don't want to get there. Yeah, we have to uh, find ways to come back to the middle before we all die because this earth will be here long before, uh, long after us and it's just about will we be still here then. That's a good let's, question. Let's uh, get back to down to earth again uh, after this, sorry. I do, d you, you, you mentioned one very small thing that I just want to check because there are some French people here, they have all heard it, but so the, the, the word sufficiency, have you heard about uh, digital sobriety or sufficiency at all? Can you raise your hand if you did? Ah, okay, more than I thought. So then you don't have to explain it. I was thinking that we might have to explain it. Jana, you also wanted to add something and then there was another question by Jutta, I will get to you. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the, it's a systemic problem and most of the solution, it's, it's, it's like a big tree, think of an oak, and then most of people are talking about the leaves, that maybe we could reduce the amount of fonts on the website, maybe we could have a black, uh, dark mode, <coughs> sorry, in this case, emo emotional dark mode and whatnot, so the, uh, uh, and save some energy. But then the bulk of the of the tree is in the trunk, and we don't have any tools in that one. So that that's one thing. For the you mentioned the hard limits. I, I need to say that the fortunately we are living in EU that the superpower is regulation, and uh, the Brussel effect that the regulation actually happens outside or, or changes things outside EU too. 
So we need to be relevant as a marketplace so we can tighten the screw for every single one because EU is the only one, only body in the world that actually thinks about these things in a sort of, how to say, systemic way and then taking the different kind of human rights and the nature and the other into account. And it's not the totalitarian like in China or it's not the complete free market and states. But if we lose that we don't have enough consumers in the EU, then we will lose that regulation superpower that we currently are using, I think, quite well, actually. I agree with you. When, when we started with the SCA, I was not a big fan of regulation. And now I have to say I also recognize the, the, the superpower. And it, it, it does work. Um, Jutta, I didn't forget. I'll get you in a second. But I want to do a quick instant poll because I just I think it's interesting. Um, aware, we heard three things, right? Awareness, responsibility, and regulation. And I just want you to raise your hand. I will say the word and raise your hand if you think that's the, that's the piece that's missing. So are you thinking that awareness is missing for the topic of green coding? Raise your hand. OK, interesting. Well, you're aware now. Um, solved. <laughs> what about uh, responsibility? Is it about really clearly assigning responsibility for environmental impact to a person? Raise your hand. Ah, it's about half. OK, interesting. And then regulation was the third one. Ooh, that's, that's more than responsibility. Interesting. Okay, so we're not going to use regulation to enforce responsibility. Okay, interesting. Thank you for the feedback. It's useful. Jutta, on you go. Yeah, so also back to the cognitive load and, and how difficult this, it is for developers. And, and I, I completely agree also with the answers. And I still wonder if we, we all mainly forgot about that. Well, I, I'm old enough to remember when we coded in a way that was where we had in mind that the bandwidth is limited, the connectivity wasn't really reliable, the performance wasn't there, the memory was small, and so on. So I, I think we all had that knowledge, and I know this will not cover all of it, but if we maybe go back to what we all once knew, well, all, <laughs> the old people like me, maybe. <laughs> um, so that that doesn't sound like it's a big cognitive load because it was all there. Yeah. So what do you think? Resource constraint software engineering? Should we bring it back? So, I mean, the, the, the resource constraint which you nowadays have is actually the credit card limit, right? And this is, the, this is the biggest, it's not the biggest problem, but it's like change the way how we do software and how we do IT nowadays. When I started, like, I don't know, 2010 in, in a big company and I ordered the server, I had to wait sometimes eight, nine months to get it. Um, a few years later, I ordered the server, it took two, three weeks because someone just has to configure the virtual machine. Nowadays, you order a server or a service, whatever you want to have. If it takes longer than three minutes, it's slow. Then, then you will choose another provider because it's way too slow. So it's more, the, the complexity comes because you want to push more responsibilities to different people. And I once talked about this like in a way like this method and ideas of DevOps are good. But what most of the time people try to do is to dance with themselves as a DevOps. But what you really need is a dev and an ops who dance together. And the biggest problem in the past was always a communication barrier. And that's why we talked in the past also about throwing things over the fence. <laughs> just get rid of the fans and dance together or play ball together and then you have less less a problem in it. And my very radical ideology to this is like, screw what we have on the infrastructure nowadays and go more to the direction which you see in like Web3, for example, which is a fully distributed environment and you do not need to care about any infrastructure related as a developer. You get your service, the infrastructure will identify by itself how much resources where you need it um, you literally don't get more than that, and you pay for every single millisecond your service is running uh, money for it. Unfortunately, we have a little bit long way. Enterprises will need way more longer than that. Governments will need, I don't know, 10 years to find this technology relevant. Um, but there are cool projects, cool open source projects, which allow this already, this purely feature-oriented um, development where I don't have to care about any other technology itself. 
I want to ask Atanas, I will get to you, Jana, in a second. Like, resource constraint software engineering from, from your perspective, do, do you feel like that's something we should embrace again, like li limiting um, how much is, uh, resources are really available? Yeah, so maybe I, I would answer with a question to the audience. Uh, if, if there are users from Kubernetes, how many of you have you tried limiting the resources of your pods? Well, it's not so many. That's not, not so great. But we, have, <laughs> but we have to ask a verifying question. Who's using Kubernetes today? Raise right. your hand. Right. Ah, it's okay. So it's half of half. Yeah, so I think uh, resource limitations are still important uh, as um, uh, putting them in. Um, currently, we, we still don't have the systems which can automatically identify them. I think you mentioned, Max, that uh, uh, such kind of systems are being developed in open source community to automatically identify resource limitations of software packages. But until then, uh, I think it's, it's good to think about it because first uh, components in, in, in the software stack can, can process this kind of resource requests and put them on the right hardware, right kind of instances, um, do better packaging um, basically of, of these resources so that you utilize the underlying instances better. So I think uh, until we have the automatic means to, to distribute, distribute that in, in a, or do the bin packing in a better way, uh, we, we should still think about it. Um, and yeah, so resource utilization is important. We, we did some, some benchmarking of, of uh, actually microservice work, workloads. Um, there is some sort of business logic um, um, microservice for simulating a shop. Um, and we did uh, a benchmark on scale. What's the machine utilization running such thing on a small cluster, like four or five nodes? And it turned out like it was 20, 40 percent. Uh, if you don't uh, do any tuning, if you use this kind of deployments without defining where resources or what resources you want to utilize and where the, those end. Um, so, yeah, uh, th this is definitely an issue you can end on uh, underutilizing your infrastructure and you might still get charged for that. Uh, it's the idea of waste. I'll get to the question in a sec. I just want to redirect to Jana real quick. Um, waste also, the topic, I think, in that context may be interesting. Yeah, I need to first touch on the web tree because I don't agree at all. So the uh, <coughs> Currently, it's a play field with crypto bros that typically don't understand technology or finances or anything else, but just focus on trying to get rich. So the, uh, mm, and uh, if you make things easier, the usage will grow. And then going back to the golden 80s, uh, I think that the, if you have been used to the level of quality of nowadays, then it would be really hard. I would, that I don't know how many of you would be interested to uh, stop using a flushing toilet and use something else instead, because it would be more ecological. But then you would uh, you freeze your ass in the Finnish winter in the, in the outhouse and so forth. So the, uh, maybe not. So I would be really cautious of those things, that the adding more technology that the technology got us into this, this ditch already. So most probably it won't drag us out, adding more of that. But it, it, it needs to be attitude change. Maybe rationing like, uh, like in 50s. I was, I'm not, I'm not that old, so the, uh, <coughs> but I've heard stories that, the, that then you couldn't buy all the stuff that you, you wanted, but you just need to buy a certain amount and then cope with that. Maybe we end up with that at the end because in the long run, I think that that would be good for the business because there's, as they say, that there's no business in the dead planet, so we need to do something about it. Yeah. Um, about you, Jutta, um, I agree with you that if you, anything that is easy, that um, requires little effort, will just increase using that. So for me, the question is, how can we get to green coding being as easy as possible? Yeah, today you have a lot of measuring tools, but it's still really difficult. Yeah, you, you start going down the rabbit hole and you will never get out of it again because 
suddenly um, it all gets complicated in itself. So I think making stuff like measuring and uh, giving hints how to make things better as easy as possible it has to be one way. You want to get. But I always ask myself, I myself, I lead a very simple life compared to where I live in Germany here. I buy very little stuff and so on. And I'm very happy about it. So I always ask myself, how can we get societies to um, enjoy simpleness again? Yeah, that's, and um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you, you won't be able to take away comfort that is there today, but we are far above the level of comfort. Yeah, we have a lot put on top of it. And that adds to cognitive load and, and stress in people, in societies. Yeah, and the reason is because the whole system is, I mean, it, yeah, is we're living in a capitalist system yeah, that is uh, meant to generate more money. And uh, what do I do with my excess money? I give it away and, um, yeah, basically find ways to drag money out of the system and put it where where that level of comfort is not there yet. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, for, for Green Coding Berlin here, for Arne and Boa Vista, you heard like make it more convenient, right? I just that's your task. And there was a question up here, if I can. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I agree with what you said, but I think that voluntary acts for changing, I don't think that's strong enough. I think that takes a lot of time. It's nice to have. Uh, I also think that regulation can get as far as something, but as you know, reg make, making regulation takes a lot of time. Implementing it also takes a lot of time, agreements, and in the EU, and then as you say, you kind of hurt competition, uh, unless it's like the same for the whole world. So um, I believe in economic incentives, and I think many companies have had good experiences in uh, bringing in uh, carbon pricing, internal virtual carbon pricing for traveling, for using of resources. Why do you think, uh, would it be realistic, possible, and effective to include carbon pricing for uh, efficiency of software and coding? Who wants to take that first, Janne? Yeah. <coughs> I think that you, <coughs> sorry, I think that you hit the nail on the head, so the, uh, we should not make green coding easier, but we should make non-green coding extremely expensive. So that would be the way to go. That it's probably the easier route because you just can't fix most of the software problems with measuring. That you know that this, this is bad code and measuring it again doesn't really change the status. You might be able to tweak it a bit, but if you think about how much data there is in the world and that needs to be processed, how, how much so images every one of us generate, how they are processed all the time, how they are transferred, stored, that won't change. So it should be more expensive that if the, every photo that you take in this very event would cost you 10 euros, then you would take way less photos and you would consume less of the resources. But now it's extremely cheap. And uh, there the regulation could help and I think that the carbon carbon pricing to the electricity used by the data centers would make a change and it, it I would also maybe maybe have an energy tax that is would be also progressive I'm come from Finland we know how to tax people so the uh, <clears throat> and the and while we do it almost 90 percent of the Finns think that the tax man is is good guy so we have combined these two things that are, are, might, might, be, might be sort of, sort of other ends of the, of the spectrum. But anyhow, so if there would be a progressive tax, the more you spend electricity, the more you have to pay for the electricity per kilowatt, that it, it just goes up and up, then we would have a dramatic shift of the mindsets because there would be the economic incentive that you mentioned. But who would be able to do, pull this off because then they would go to some other place where the electricity is not taxed. And then we should have an information tax on the EU border and uh, it, it gets complicated. And if there are some EU government, government people here, I'm, I'm afraid to talk to you after the event. I have some ideas. 
Uh, I think the answer, though, is yes. I, I get from Jana. Um, the I want to ask Max, and then I ask you, and then I ask Anita. Um, Max, Kubernetes. Is it possible to integrate some economic incentive like this, make it visible um, on the on on the so to say control plane layer? Uh, yeah, and we do already. So the the practice around this is kind of simple. Uh, comes a lot from from FinOps perspectives, labeling things and so on and so forth. You can measure almost everything. So to combine this both information is relatively easy, um, but. I think to find the right approach for it is relatively hard because uh, you need to find the right the, the right lane between like it is motivating me as a company to do something or I get a slight punishment but I will not keep cutting off the European market because in terms of digital era Europe is anyhow falling behind in, in a couple of years so putting more punishments around it would be I think even more contra not helpful at all because then all our regulations doesn't needs to apply for anything because nothing will happen here right and this is the, the very difficult corner where we where we have to go to um, there's good practices on matching the carbon footprint to some uh, cost reduction in a cloud um, which can be a good incentive and maybe it's a good well, punishment on the other hand side, and I, I really would take it as a punishment to say, like, if you not at least move your ass as a company to do something and to improve your infrastructure and your code, then you have to pay whatever factor on addition to compensate it. Right. So there's a, there's some bucket of gold waiting in the end of the rainbow if you do something, but if you don't, then well, the crumples comes and hit you hard. Yeah. The beauty about the European single market, by the way, is that we can also force regulation on people coming here, not just on ourselves, right? I think that's, um, that's something we could consider. Um, Anita, first. Yeah, I forgot half of what I wanted to say, but um, <laughs> when, when something becomes ever more expensive, someone's going to be willing to pay for it, and we already have a system where those who are richest cause the most damage on the planet and that that money that um, you, you take from this it's gonna go t to somewhere else and it's gonna cost damage somewhere else down the line it's another level of, of complexity but I still agree with you yeah in the end um, we have to get to some point where we can start and I think a good starting point is um, that basically nobody wants to destroy the planet. Yeah, we want to be good, we just often don't know how. And I see that if you go to developers, tell them clearly what to do, make it easy for them to do something and show them how they change things by that way. They, they are drawn to that by themselves and they are happy to do something. I, I just uh, see that people nowadays often think they can't do anything because they're in a bad, um, 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 bad uh, industry or whatever or have a job where, where it's not directly connected to saving the world or whatever. But I think there's potential in every job and if you yeah, show people how to do this, they, they are happy. Do you agree with uh, with Anita that you feel like yeah, okay you you feel like you can do something you just need to be told what <laughs> yeah 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 uh, a little bit okay uh, today you will find out what you can do just stay here listen it uh, there will be a lot of talk about what to do Atanas yeah I, I when I was listening to the previous talks also the keynote at the beginning I had this kind of or small kind of idea you you have basically in open source community you have something called the open source scoring card uh, of, of, of repositories how good is the repository is it unit tested uh, integration tested and so on why not have a green scoring card green software scoring card basically where which can improve the awareness of, of companies or users of that software package how good is it 
like you have that for any kind of electronics in, in the shops. If you go and you want to buy, buy a fridge, you will not buy a D-class fridge. You most probably want to buy A-class fridge. Um, so, right. Yeah, I, I do. I can tell you that that's what we did in the software project. This label. Yeah. Uh, this label. Um, before, I, I need to focus us because now comes the second question, the, the probably uh, the most interesting one. How do we take um, the barriers down? So we earlier discussed, we came to, to, uh, to a few issues that we saw. Uh, for example, that people are not aware but th uh, where we're missing regulation. I think we talked excessively about regulation. This is the most regulation-heavy software engineering panel I've ever heard. Um, so that's nice. Um, software developers are becoming more political. That's interesting. Um, but what other things can we do? What can we do to take the barriers down to a wider adoption of green coding? And Max, I'll let you start if you want. Um, so, yeah, it starts all with awareness. And what you mentioned is actually what uh, our um, technical advisory group for environmental sustainability is working on, to give all the open source software um, a scoring card for how they perform between the releases. But it's not about the actual CO footprint, but the relative CO footprint, so that they can see the change between um, when they have really changed the software, not the infrastructure. Changing the infrastructure is the easiest way, and that's, it's not necessarily a part of the answer, but you could change some part of the infrastructure. However, it's a chicken egg problem, because if you want to buy new infrastructure, you cause carbons. If you want to have a new data center, you cause new carbons. So it's always a, a very problematic balance of back and forth. So for me to, to break this down is always like we need to radically optimize the foundational layer, stop putting layer on layers, right? That's, it's sometimes getting insane how many virtualizations you have in between something and then it's just running like a little web server with a stupid website where someone once in a month needs to click on something it does not make sense. And we see these mistakes continuously happening. Right? Um, so we can reduce there a lot of waste, digital waste, and, and optimize it. And that's what I mean actually also with Web3. I'm not talking about the block stand sh stuff. This is, this is the bullshit in it. But the way how they are doing things and, and optimizing for the software, the infrastructure, and like literally shut everything down what is not needed, this, this is something which is, which is needed um, on the side. And yeah, uh, I'm talking about the cognitive load. Um, so it's a bad answer on cognitive load to say we need more automation on top of it. <laughs> but I think at some point we maybe hit this, this, this fine line where it's not adding something on top, but where it starts reducing again and give just people more headspace to think about other best practices, to lift more best practices in the direction of green coding. Sweet summer child, I can answer. You can continue, Anita, if you want. Um, well, I, I, s I don't see the real problem in... No, that's a bad start. Um, <laughs> I think we can agree that if we were to get to a point where every bit of energy that the hardware consumes is uh, coming from green, whatever, all would be fine but I'm very sure that we'll never get to that point. So even if we reach that point, we'd still have the problem that we need real physical resources to build all this infrastructure and to build all the windmills and solar panels and whatnot, and they are destroying the planet yeah, by extracting stuff. And so I think a circular economy, it's not really a closed loop, I know that, but um, keeping stuff in use as long as possible, physical stuff, that has to be part of the solution. And I think maybe it's um, not, not allowing to sell hardware or whatever, yeah, to f force those that sell hardware to also take it back in the end because it would uh, lead to that hardware being built differently yeah, to getting those resources back. I once heard that one kilogram of, um, of electrical waste has more gold in it than one kilogram of gold ore, whatever. There's, there's so much mining that you can do from getting that stuff back and 
um, if you stay the owner of a device, you, you have an incentive to build that device differently so you can get the resources back better. And I think that part has to be part of the solution, even if it's way out ahead, but yeah, coming from the outside, going in. Yeah. Yeah, and I think especially Anna mentioned it this morning, if you're thinking like, oh, hardware, but that's not me, I do software, I, I see you, I get you. Um, software really plays a key role in, in, in driving the requirements for hardware, right? So if, if you build software that keeps on saying, I need more memory, I need more speed, um, people will upgrade their laptops, they will upgrade their, their phones. Um, and I think that's really an important topic that we, we stop, um, we really have to stop that. In, yeah, right in now we buy green conscience, conscious, conscience. <laughs> Because con conscience. a conscience, we buy ourselves a clean conscience, is that? Yeah. Ein reines Gewissen, yeah? If it's green, it doesn't cause emissions, hey, everything's fine, I can just use this more. And I don't believe in that because we still have that physical resource problem behind it and the water usage problem and... Yeah, it's all connected. That's why I just want to mention that. The, the easiest so. statistic to remember on this, and then I'll continue, is uh, the electronic waste of Europe last year weighs as much as the Chinese wall. 125,000 jumbo jets, yes. and it grows, yeah. Uh, so, so green coding is not just about, green software is not just about green electricity, it's also about, um, yeah, about the resource usage. That's why we say resource efficient uh, software. Could I want to continue, but there was also a question in between. We've continued first. Yeah, continue first. Sorry. Um, who did I not have? I got a bit distracted. Damn it. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that the, the awareness and the lot of other things that mentioned it, it's, it's, and the sort of how to apply the knowledge is about the education and the, uh, the, that the university should include this in the curriculum and so forth. There should be these these kind of things that it, it sort of becomes mainstream. And then all the all the people that are thinking of running businesses, then then if you if you create a business, try to make a sustainable one. Try to make something that actually changes the world for better and not just for better for your bank account. Because if the if we are going to burn with the world, then the your hefty bank account doesn't really help anything. Might be actually actually be a, that you are one that is hunted because you have the money, so the uh, it's it's not not straightforward answer. So make sustainable and uh, as an option, a viable option, a better option, and and be fearless making that happen. And then some of those will will fail and fall. But that's the that how business goes. But some might actually change the world for the better. Uh, we have a lot of people here that create green coding related tools. I see questions. Yeah, I'll get them. Um, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. I have to ask Atana as well. Um, and there's a lot of people making tools here. And I also want to say I, I like that a lot. Be fearless. So um, this this will work. Atanas, what do you think? How do we take down barriers? And then I'll get to the questions. Yeah. The I think uh, doing some some more kind of training in the community about the tools available. As, uh, you, there is a lot of there are a lot of tools from from different companies and, and a lot of developers are just not using them. And uh, as you said, it, it, there are maybe some some of them are too complex uh, to to start with and not for everybody. So they have to be simplified. Maybe extract the essence uh, of, of, of the output of those tools in an easy and understandable way in, in web interfaces or in some sort of uh, front end. Um, yeah, that, that's part of what should be done. And um, the, the other thing, uh, yeah. So uh, I think that that's a good start and the, the I was thinking maybe we were speaking about that there are layers after layers after layers, uh, but some of the tasks can be still automatized. Um, so for example, finding the best resources. If you have um, a workload which is not that smart, which, which let's say puts your CPU on uh, to, to idle half of the time, maybe you can have a, a layer <laughs> which, which basically uh, turns off the CPU at that time or puts it in more, um, more 
lower frequency so that you don't waste power uh, for such kind of things. So, um, yeah, require most probably from the vendors or the software developers developing those layers that they are almost invincible and, and yeah, not, not, uh, not hard, <laughs> the develop, not make the life of developers harder. <laughs> Well, you are a vendor, so off you go. You can build another layer for us to <laughs> turn off the CPU. I think we would appreciate right. that. Uh, we have time for one question. We'll do one. Uh, sorry, that was the first one, so I go. OK, I'll just make it quick. Uh, based on all the talks, I, I kind of zone it into two, and that is awareness and regulation. Because without awareness and understanding that there's a problem and um, I know how to go about it, then it becomes complex, like Maswell was saying. And the second is regulation. If the regulators have no understanding regarding what green coding is, then how can they make regulations that are effective? And uh, my first question now will go to Janne, because uh, from Finland, we have the climate and uh, environmental strategy for ICT, and I think uh, Finland is the first. And that's happened because of awareness. So they know what the strategies to, to implement, to propose. And in Finland now, I, I feel like in the Nordic, we are leading regarding this aspect of sustainability, green coding and all. How can we take that to Europe and the world? Because if Europe say we can do this, um, companies can go out where they can basically do stuff at low cost, no problem. So basically we are failing because we lose out of money. And to the whole panelists, how can we then create awareness for regulators in a way where we can have EU regulation, for those in Europe and those coming to do business in Europe and influence the world. I give you both 10, all 10 seconds to answer the second question. So how do we make regulators more aware? Because time. Uh, with the Finland strategy, I haven't yet seen that it has that much affected things. My uh, idea is that they follow the golden rule. Who, who has the gold makes the rules. So public organizations procuring from Europe should add green software in their requirements immediately because they exist for the good of the people and green software is probably better for the people than non-green software. Okay. Public procurement, yeah, interesting. Who wants to go next? Ten seconds. Yeah. Maybe, uh, sorry, uh, maybe identify proper benchmarks uh, to uh, it will be important part of the procurement to analyze these systems and, uh, and software to have a comparison. or measurement tool and, and guardrails. Mm -hmm. Anita, Max, making regulators aware, what would you do? Should we do like online courses? What is software? Mm, I'm not sure if that helps. Uh, I have no idea about lobbying, but I guess that we need people who continuously annoy the regulators and tell them and explain them by every time when they go for drinking a coffee that they should take uh, their cup with them and not get a paper and what's on. Um, I, because like I have often the feeling from, from the open source perspective from the Linux Foundation advisory board and what we see on the, all the different acts which are going to be decided on in the European Parliament, most of the time when you read them is like people with zero understanding have written it, and people with zero understanding needs to vote on it. How to get people who understand it to vote it? Is it really that person who sits in the parliament, or do we need subgroups who really understand the topic, can vote on it, or give a direction on it, and just say like, hey people, it sounds good, please just approve it one more time? Or more IT people in parliament. If you want to become a politician, now's the time. <laughs> Anita, closing, 10 seconds. How do we make policymakers aware? No idea. No idea. Okay. So we annoy them. That was Max's yeah. other point. We yeah, annoy yeah. them. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Very good. So with this, we conclude our panel. Thank you, guys. You can stay for a minute. Um, I'm going to stand up again.